thing I still think we should get moving. Um, we do have minutes that were distributed. Would anybody like to move approval of the minutes of the last meeting? Uh, Mayor so, Williams will move approval and Mayor Hovland will second. We have a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, Bridget, will you take the roll, please? Mary Liz Hilbert. Yes. Peter Bell. Peter Bell. Pat Bourne. Yes. Bay Cole. Bay Cole. Kahua Hoffman. Yes. Jim Hovland. Aye. Yes. Elizabeth Cout. Yes. Doug Loon. Yes. Mary Jo McGuire. Aye. Connie Subjam. Yes. George Schember. Aye. Aline Sharamoff. Aline Sharamoff. Tom Weaver. Tom Weaver. Janet Williams. Aye. Jerry <clears throat> Zhao. Aye. Okay, great. So then the rest of our agenda, we have a presentation um, that by Dave uh, Thiessen, the Deputy General Counsel and that Council with a little bit of background information on the MPO compliance issue, very brief. Then we'll have a presentation on paratransit in the Metro versus Greater Minnesota. And then we'll move into committee discussion on our uh, our uh, task at hand and try and begin to frame up some uh, recommendations for the governor. So with that, Dave, looks like you're ready. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, thank you. And members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to come here. Um, I am the Deputy General Counsel for the Metropolitan Council. Um, I do not have a PowerPoint, but what I did have for you was a handout, a one page handout with uh, six attachments. And a lot of the information that I've been covering here is also there. So thank you again for the invitation. I'd like to start out just very briefly, and I'll be very brief uh, from the entire presentation because I know you're short on time. Uh, a couple of your committee members have to leave early, so I'll be very brief. Uh, I'd like to start out with some key dates. And these are key because they're related to the Metropolitan Council's organization and structure, which is an important concept under federal law. So in 1967, the Metropolitan Council was created by the Minnesota legislature, it was, and it was created to coordinate the planning and development of the seven county area. In 1975, the Minnesota legislature designated the Metropolitan Council as the planning agency for any long range comprehensive planning responsibilities that, require, that were required under federal law. The council has had multi uh, modal transportation planning responsibilities under federal law since 1975, and it's been un uninterrupted since that time. In 1994, the legislature um, enacted what was called the Metropolitan Reorganization Act of 1994. And the key element of that legislation was the um, abolition of the Metropolitan Transit Commission the Regional Transit Board, and the Metropolitan Waste Control Commission. Now, the legislature abolished those three regional agencies and transferred all of their duties and responsibilities to the Metropolitan Council. The other thing that legislation in 1994 did was it, it changed the staggered terms of the Metropolitan Council members from staggered to the terms ending with the end of the governor. So that was um, goes to sort of the structure and organization of the council as well. In 2012, there was some federal legislation. It required metropolitan planning organizations to consist of local officials, officials of public transportation agencies, and state officials, and MPOs were required to comply with that statute within two years after the legislation was enacted. But the legislation also was subject to uh, what's called a grandfather clause. And it's a grandfather clause that predated the 2012 legislation and that grandfather clause says nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to interfere 
with the authority under any state law in effect on January 18, 1991 of a public agency with multimodal transportation responsibilities. And that exactly covers the Metropolitan Council because prior to December 1991, there was a state law that made the council the MPO for the region. And it's been in effect since 1975. Now the Metropolitan Council is a major recipient of Federal Transit Administration and Federal Highway Administration funding. If you recall the council was recently awarded almost a billion dollars in the Federal Transportation Administration funding for the Southwest LRT project. And it has continually um, been subject to review by the FTA and to a lesser extent the Federal Highway Administration for its compliance with its regional and federal planning obligations under federal law and its status as the MPO for this region. Now you heard last, at your last meeting that the attorney for representing some of the counties or the initiative on transparency, that they believe the council is not legally in compliance with the federal statute. It's true that the governing body of the Metropolitan Council does not include local officials, public transportation agency officials, or state officials, but the grandfather provision also is a valid federal law. And Congress said notwithstanding this requirement for MPOs, if there was a metropolitan planning organization that was operating under state law at the time, in 1991, then the, that organization will continue to um, be designated as the MPO for the region. The Federal Highway Administration and the FDA have confirmed the council is covered under the grandfathering provision, and they are fully aware of the council's status as a recipient of federal funding and its status as an MPO for this region. I have included in my attachments uh, two letters. One is from the regional offices of the Federal Transit Administration and the Federal Highway Administration. They were confirming that the attachment it's the August 15th letter, it's attachment one. And those agencies concluded that the designation of the council as the MPO back in 1973 by Governor Anderson, quote, was in conformance with both federal law and regulations and that the existing structure remains compliant, close quote. In a follow-up letter from the headquarters of USDOT in February of 2016, the uh, DOT offices concurred with the federal regions, region, regional offices' conclusions. According to the US DOT, changes in the council's organization or structure, including the uh, 1994 state legislation on the regional uh, reorganization of the agencies, that the council's, um, um, and also including changes to the length of council members' terms, which was their staggered terms to now coterminous with the governor, did not constitute a substantial change and did not require an MPO designation because of the grandfathering clause in the federal law. According to the federal agencies out of Washington, D.C., the, quote, core of the Metropolitan Council structure and organization remains the same as it was in 1991. So their conclusion is that under prevailing federal law, the council is the properly designated MPO for the seven county metropolitan area. Well, the last thing I'd like to go over very briefly is the um, tab. It's been suggested that the transportation advisory board is not representative or does not include local and elected other elected officials in the decision making on um, metropolitan transportation planning and funding. However, under state law, more than 50% of the tab must be comprised of county and local officials, elected officials. And that, to discuss that a little bit in attachment six, you can see where that falls out. And that's all, I haven't identified all of the members of the tab. I think I've identified 30 or 34. The other two were uh, MnDOT and MAC. And then there's one more, but, um, Representation on the tab is required by state law. It's not something the council could change. And more than 50% of the tab represent local and county elected officials. And finally, I would say that the tab is well represented in the decision-making for transportation planning and funding in this region. The council has operated under a protocol or a 
uh, an agreement since the early 70s to later that there's a process under which TAB makes recommendations on funding, for instance. Those fundings come to the Metropolitan Council for consideration. Now, this happens infrequently. It's my understanding the council sometimes has a disagreement about what should be included for funding projects, for instance, but the council does not modify tab recommendation. What it does is send it back to the tab for reconsideration. And then there's sort of an iterative process if that's necessary until they come to a conclusion and, and a, um, um, a decision on what, what the project should be. So um, I think that's very thumbnail outline of the council status of the MPO and the tab. And Madam Chair, that's all I have for you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions at this point? Anybody, uh, Eileen? I just had a really quick question. Thanks for that presentation, Dave. Um, you know, I've heard a couple of times people talking about like having an understanding of the will of Congress and was interested in understanding if there had been anything other than, you know, what was in already kind of outlined in statute um, to have a different interpretation of the will of Congress at the time. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I think if you look at attachment three, it says it pretty clearly. Uh, at the time of the 2012 federal legislation, Congress had already had the grandfather provision in there. Congress did not change it. And then in 2018, there was some legislation moving through Congress. Um, and in early 2018, there was an amendment in the House version of that legislation that would have uh, essentially abolished the grandfather clause, at least with respect to the Metropolitan Council. That amendment in the House did not make it through the legislative process and it did not make it in the Senate bill, and it was not in the final mm -hmm. legislation signed by the president in October of 2018. So I think it's fair to say that Congress has had a chance to look at it. They decided not to change it. And if you look at attachment three, there's on page four, I won't read it, but essentially the FTA, the USDOT has said that, cited the United States Supreme Court case for the proposition that if Congress enacts a legislation that doesn't change what's already in, done before, then it's a pretty good indication that they're sat they, Congress, is satisfied with the uh, interpretation of the statute. It's really helpful. I just wasn't, but I was, I thought there might have been some other document out there that was like, sometimes Congress writes their intent in, in a separate forum, but this is, that's helpful clarification. Thank you. All right, Mayor Coates. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dave, with regard to the tab, is it possible uh, to get around um, when the tab makes a recommendation to the Met Council and there's a disagreement? Uh, couldn't the, the tab make um, and then just have the council ratify the uh, ratify the uh, the action of the tab? Rather than having them approve it, just have them ratify it. Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, Madam Mayor, I had a hard time understanding you're kind of breaking up there. But... Oh, well, sorry. I, I think too we've got people that aren't muted. That are we've got? I think Mayor Hovland, you're not muted, and we're getting some background on your audio too. So <laughs> let's um, there. That might help. So um, yeah, Dave. Um, so my question is this with regard to the tab and sometimes the discrepancy that arises when the tab makes a recommendation and the council doesn't agree with it. How about could it be possible that the tab um, approves the, the item and then just have them at council ratify it. And if there's some discrepancy, they can ask for um, a reevaluation or they can give their opinion about why they think there is a discrepancy. I, I would think that that would uh, alleviate some of the, the conflict. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm not well versed in, in enough to answer that question for you. Nick Thompson will be coming for you, I think, later, if you have time for questions from him. 
but I think it's just, it, I, it's my understanding that that conflicts don't happen very often. I know there's a lot of interest in transportation projects, for instance, but I think they always tend to work it out. The tab comes up with the recommendation, the council finally concurs with it. And that's, I think that's formally what they call, we concur with what the tab has done and so they move it forward. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. It does. I, I was just hearing the conflict that sometimes happens between the tab and the council on some issues. And you say that it doesn't often that it doesn't happen that often. So finding a way that just um, eliminates some of that conflict. Yes, All right, uh, Commissioner McGuire. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate um, Mayor Kautz's uh, questioning, because mine was on similar lines. I know that the TAB, this is in regards to TAB, that it's called the Transportation Advisory Board. So it's it's got advisory in its name, but I, I always thought it wasn't so advisory that we really did get to, you know, um, let Met Council know what we wanted and that they really, as you have said, they didn't, they wouldn't change it until they came back to us. So would you... I'm just curious what your opinion is, and I can ask Nick Thompson this as well. Do you consider it an advisory board, or do you consider it more than that? What What would you, in your based on these rulings that you've, you know, and these the the documents that you've been that you shared with us? What would, would what 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 status would you give the tab? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I know that by statute it's called the advisory committee, but in the context of what the council normally does with advisory committees, and I'm sure municipal and county government as well, advisory committees are there for the purposes of taking on issues assigned by the governing body and making recommendations uh, to the governing body. But I think ultimately the decision-making authorities rest with the governing body. In this case, the protocol, the, the um, the process under which they've been operating for 45 years is different than that. There's a concurrence. It's more of a concurrence than a take your recommendation and thank you or no thank you. It's we need to reach a concurrence and agreement on what's in, for instance, a package of transportation projects. So I would say it's probably technically not an advisory committee that we would normally think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I I, I concur. I, I think that is, I was just curious what we might call it otherwise, because I, I do believe where TAP operates in a more than advisory, more than just advisory. So thank you. That's just part of what I'm thinking about in all of this. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Hovland. I don't know if this is uh, by state statute, by uh, rule or regulation or policy, but in the years I've served on the TAB, my understanding is that the Met Council can either approve what the TAB does or disapprove of it. And if they disapprove of it, it has to come back to the TAB for further consideration. They cannot modify in any fashion what the TAB has done. It's either voted up or voted down. Okay, that's helpful. Any other questions or comments before we go on to the next? Uh, Doug Loon. Um, just a quick question for Dave. And I'm a little hesitant to ask the question, but I'm just curious. Um, as we think about, Dave, about this grandfathered status and the affirmation that you outlined in your in your handouts uh, of it, if the Met Council were to go to a staggered term versus a full change in having repre elected representatives serve on the Met Council, would that jeopardize the current status that the Met Council enjoys as a grandfathered entity. In other words, changing it, would that put that in jeopardy? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I think if the council or the legislature, because the council can't do this itself, of course, if the legislature were to change the governance of the Metropolitan Council from a serving terms that end with the term of the governor, to staggered terms, I don't think that would be a substantial change under federal law or regulation that would require redesignation. If the legislature were to change the composition of the governing body substantially, expand it, um, make it elected, change the representation, that may trigger a redesignation requirement under federal state, or excuse me, federal law and federal regulations. 
Can I do a follow up, Madam Chair? Of course. So if uh, the Met Council, the legislature would have changed the makeup of the Met Council and have elected officials serve on the Met Council, would that not then be in compliance with the expectations of the federal government under the traditional MPO status? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, depending on how that legislation were drafted, it could be, depending on what it is. If it's too substantially different from the representation and proportional decision-making right now, that could probably trigger a redesignation under federal law. And I'm guessing that since federal law preempts state law, uh, it would be regardless of what state law says on that, if it's in conflict with federal law, we'd have, we, the Metropolitan Council, the governor would have to apply, uh, comply with the federal requirements. Okay, um, I think we got Connie and then Pat. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilor, I had a question. Maybe use your imagination. Is it possible, since we're saying that the tab is more than what it is in legislation, which is an advisory board, can it simply, can the tab simply be called an MPO and come out from under the council? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I don't believe so. Not under state law, current state law. Uh, the, the FTA and the Federal Highway Administration have both said that the Metropolitan Council is a designated MPO, and that's pursuant to state law in Chapter 473.146. Yeah, I, I understand it. you can't just do it, but could, could it be on the table maybe as a, as a possibly a, a simple, maybe a simpler solution to whatever else come up? Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, I don't think I could say that would be a simple solution. I'd have to know more about it. Depends on how it pans out and, and how it uh, dovetails with federal law. I'm sorry, Kim. All right, Pat. Back to Doug's question, which I think is an interesting one. Um, I, from what I think we've been told, if the legislature were to say, uh, decide that that certain elected officials were to sit on the Met Council, and that being that making enough of a change in the MPO uh, analysis by the federal government, it's not just the legislature that would make that decision on MPO status. It, it doesn't the doesn't the federal uh, designation also require that 75% of the local governments and the largest municipality have to sign off on that redesignation also? Madam Chair, members of the committee, that's true. Um, if there is a substantial change in structure or organization of an MPO, then that triggers federal law, federal regulations, and under Federal law and federal regulations. Redesignation requires the approval of the governor, at least 75% of the cities within the MPO area, and that includes the largest city in that metropolitan area. Now, since Hudson, Wisconsin, or at least a part of it is currently part of the MPO area, I guess you could also argue that they have to be with the concurrence of the governor of the state of Wisconsin. I'm not sure that's the way it would pan out, but that's the way the statute seems to read right now. So regardless of what the state does, if there is, or the legislature in this case, if there is a substantial change in de uh, um, uh, redesignation is, is required, then it has to comply with federal law. And that includes a de re de redesignation process. Okay, any other questions? So, um, Elizabeth, remind me, you have to leave at quarter to three. Mayor, Mayor Coates, do you have to leave at quarter to three? In, I, um, Madam Chair, I can, I can leave at 10 minutes to three. Yeah, okay. I, I will push it. I, I've got all of my uh, information that I need for my report. 
Okay, so Judd, are we going to be able to get through this next presentation and still have time for some discussion prior to that? Uh, Madam Chair and members, we certainly should. This is a pretty short uh, presentation that Nick's going to give. Okay, let's rock and roll then. All right, Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yep. All right, so again, Nick Thompson, Director of the MTS Division, that is one of our responsibilities is the Metro Mobility Transit Paratransit Program. And in your committee's charge, you're looking at uh, transit in the region. And thought, I thought we'd, based on a couple of questions, we'd give a little comparison of paratransit in the metro area compared to greater Minnesota, and it might shape some of your recommendations. Next slide, please. So there are very different services between what is in the, in the Twin Cities and what is in greater Minnesota for transit. And it's uh, the way to think about it is Greater Minnesota is 80, I'm going to call it ADA services for those with disabilities, is governed by federal law and is only in the communities listed there. Whereas the Metro Mobility is governed by both federal law and in our case, the state law has put a much broader scope on where and how we deliver services for those with disabilities. <laughs> in Minnesota, it includes those with disabilities, but also these systems include those that are elderly, not necessarily elderly, do not necessarily, or often aren't ones that are certified with disabilities. And, and the Metro Mobility in the Twin Cities is just for those with disabilities certified, no matter what their age. Very different in terms of trip lengths because, uh, which affects the price and service levels. Um, it's just within the city limits of the areas in greater Minnesota in the Twin Cities, it's the boundary as defined by the state legislature in 2006, and with a little bit of change since then. So a much bigger area than um, co covers um, many of the cities within the urban area, urbanized area of the Twin Cities region. Another big difference is uh, how it was defined on what the service level is. Greater Minnesota, the driver picks you uh, up at the door and drops you off there. In the Twin Cities, the driver escorts you all the way into and out of the facility that your ride is going on. And that has a big impact on the time a trip takes um, between the two services. Next slide, please. The scale is much different in the requirements because uh, in Greater Minnesota it is growing at a slower pace. They're planning for growth but it's within the, the budget of funds that they probably have from MVEST and State General Fund. Or in the Great Minnesota, or in metro area, we are growing at six to nine percent a year. This year is going to be an exception. We don't know what the COVID impact is long term, but growing at a, at a pace that's been very large, and the budget grows at that almost similar pace. Um, and in the met, in the Twin Cities, we have to meet demand. Um, we are required. To never deny a trip in the federal area and so whatever the demand is we must meet it and just because our population is growing so fast in the metro area and and by default the number of people with disabilities grows with the population our budget has been growing you can see the difference also in the scale uh, of ridership you know it's 10 times larger in the twin cities than it is in greater minnesota budgets 10 times larger um, a little bit different funding between the two where is in greater Minnesota, they rely primarily on MVEST to fund the service in, in the Twin Cities and which has been an issue, and will be a big issue next year and the next couple of years with the deficit is that it's the operation is funded almost totally by general fund with payers taking up the rest of it. And with that six to 9% growth, it's been put on quite a bit of pressure on the budget but it's a budget that must be met because we must meet the demand. So um, there's definitely a, a state general fund pressure uh, with our Metro Mobility Programming. And they have a little bit different capital funding source, uh, whereas the council provides the match through the regional transit capital, which is property tax based in greater Minnesota. It's a mix of the federal invest and a little bit of local through shares or local communities. So kind of different, very different mixes of how they're funded and how they're growing. Next slide. And one of the issues that we've been wrestling with, and I think 
has been raised as a question uh, by members of the committee is like, is there, is there something in Greater Minnesota that is very different than Metro uh, besides what I've already talked about? And one of that is in this uh, premium special services. In Greater Minnesota, the tran transfer companies create special contracts that in essence are funded through uh, Department of Human Services. These are ones where the transit provider can charge a higher fare or higher rate by having a premium premium direct contract. Whereas in the metro area, we even we do not have that. We are only able to charge for almost a similar type of trip the fare that is the cost for metro mobility. DHS pays a portion of that fare. The counties pay a portion of that fare for these type of trips. Um, but we we believe we don't, I don't have any hard numbers for you that in Greater Minnesota they are finding ways to uh, get more non-transportation funding into their premium services category. And that might be something that'd be a recommendation. Um, the most common example of these are in the category we call day training and habilitation centers, which are uh, adults with severe, severe cognitive disabilities that require um, adult daycare services. It makes a big portion of our trips and in Greater Minnesota, those are ones I believe that they're contracting through these premium services to take a little bit of pressure off of the transportation budget uh, allocation uh, for that services. In uh, but they're very similar in types of the type of individual trip being made. So you can see that in both cases, there's a strong I think ADA priority for transit in in, in the Twin Cities and in Greater Minnesota. But the outcome of through state through how we operated in the Metro and a lot through some of the state laws that have passed and around governance and how they're governed, they result in different types of services. So that uh, ends the, just a brief presentation. Happy to take any questions on this. All right, thank you, Nick. Are there any questions for Nick on his presentation? Uh, Mayor Williams. We need, we need you off mute, Mayor. Mayor Williams, are you unable to unmute? Yes, no. Mayor Williams, you're muted, so we can't hear you. Oh, the joys of technology. So we still can't hear you. Um, is there anybody else that has questions at this time? We might have to circle back with Mayor Williams. Gana, try holding down your space bar. Jan Mayor Williams, are you there? Okay, this is not good. Um, oh, I heard you. No. Okay, is any anybody else have questions for Nick on the paratransit? Madam Chair, Janet, the mayor is in there. And, and in the meantime, Janet, maybe you can type your question in the chat room. Anybody else have a question for Nick? Okay, this is unfortunate. All right, I think that maybe we'll have to maybe. I, I should be unmuted. Oh, there, there you go. go. I just had a question. Yeah, my, thank you. Sorry about that. My question had to do with the, tra the taxing district. Have we ever seen some kind of a map that shows where the taxing district goes? Because it doesn't include all the metro area, right? Correct. Yes, that's correct. And we can send that out again. It's a okay. sub Because that also, that also involves uh, suburban transit too, yes, right? Yes. In, in the areas that they serve. Right. And the only thing that, so outside the transit taxing district, they don't pay the capital transit levy. 
right, the one right. element that they don't pay. But they are using it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Thanks, Nick. We appreciate the information. So the next thing we need to do is start to kind of go around the room or around the screen, if you will, on uh, kind of where we're at. And if we can remind people of the three things that the governor asked of the commission was the role of elected versus appointed Met Council. The role of Met Council as a metropolitan planning organization <clears throat> and then the effectiveness of the delivery of the regional transit service. So what I'd like to do is each each person have an opportunity to kind of weigh in on what their thoughts are in general, general around those three items. And that will prepare us for more discussion at the next meeting. And we're gonna let Mayor Coutts go first as she has another uh, commitment and then Mayor Hovland following uh, Mayor Coutts. And I think that Given our time constraints, if we evenly divide the time, nobody should take more than three minutes. Air coach. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm going to be real quick because, you know, I haven't heard anything compelling that looks at uh, changing the role of uh, the Met Council to an elected uh, versus appointed. And uh, I think it was uh, just a few years back that we went to staggered terms, and that seems to work. And also to the nominating committee uh, that uh, evaluates candidates for the Met Council, uh, that too has put a lot of uh, local elected officials, and I think, Janet, you have chaired that for about three uh, different uh, terms. And um, we had also put in place, uh, and this was from the Citizens League, that uh, when the um, uh, the committee recommends to the governor their slate, if the governor does not take that slate, the governor has to be transparent, if I'm correct, Janet, and all of that, in rejecting the slate that the committee had uh, presented. And I don't, uh, you know, I haven't heard anything compelling with regard to elected uh, sitting on the um, Met Council. And uh, Madam Chair, one of the things that uh, concerns me about all of the putting an uh, elected uh, group is what happened with CTIB. And uh, I, I just think that right now, uh, an appointed Met Council is serving us well. And then when we get to the issue of the, of the Met Council being a planning organization, I think we know that as a region, we need to make sure that we're planning simply because all of us uh, are looking to the Met Council for wastewater treatment. I don't think there's too many of us who have their own wastewater treatment plant, and we need to make sure that we have a good planning around that and good planning with regard to um, our land use throughout the metropolitan area. And then when we look at the effectiveness of uh, our transportation system, I want to make sure that we don't lose the efficiency and effectiveness of the suburban transit um, uh, services. I can tell you from all of the work, as I used to sit on the board of MVTA, that uh, our subsidies are low. But I think as we move to the future and understand uh, what the capacity is going to be, I think that's where some of the um, areas that we need to take a look at. But I don't believe that we should uh, put all of the transit services under the uh, metro transit system because we'll have problems. That's what happened in the 80s, why we have uh, the Suburban Transit Authority. So I would not... Um, want to see any changes uh, in that regard. So, Madam Chair, those are my um, overall thoughts with regard to the role of the elected versus appointed uh, and the Met Council as a planning organization and the effectiveness of, of transit. So thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Great, thank you so much. Um, appreciate that information. I think uh, Mayor Hovland also has to leave for a meeting. I'm not sure if you're in the same meeting, but um, Mayor, would you like to go next? 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. We are, in fact, in the same meeting for the U.S. Conference of Mayors, mayors and both making presentations. So uh, we'll have to be on that other call at three. <clears throat> um, when I first got on the tab uh, years ago now, I couldn't figure out, it seemed redundant that we had the we had the tab and then we had the Met Council. But I've really come over the years to appreciate uh, the model that we have and kind of celebrate the model we have. And I think we should be celebrating it as opposed to denigrating it as been, has been done uh, by so many folks over the years. Uh, there's no question in my mind about the legality of the model that we have. Uh, the beauty of what we have here now, I think, is, uh, is the tab, which makes these decisions uh, on a biennial basis about what we're going to do with those federal monies that come into the region. In my experience from being on the tab for several years and now being the chair for the last few years, is that by the time we get done with all of the work that we do as a tab, whether you're a, a conservative person from one part of the region or you're a liberal person from some other part of the region, all these different views of the world, they kind of coalesce around a, a, a methodology that's fairly uh, uh, secured and uh, obtained as to how we're going to objectively spend those federal monies. And the last thing we do is put a geographic lens on the whole thing to make sure that we've got geographic uh, balance, if you will. So uh, I, I found that the process works extraordinarily well. The majority of the people on the tab are elected officials. Uh, I think placed in a different situation where we have this MPO that is just uh, so different from anything else we have around the country where there are so many responsibilities involved other than just transportation infrastructure. When you start thinking about parks, uh, sewer and water, uh, all of these uh, tremendous responsibilities that people have, uh, I, I think that we've got a model that really works. We've got a model of regional governance that's admired around the country. Uh, I just think it would be a disservice also for local elected officials to be able to, uh, or to be serving on the Met Council because of the time involved the people I know spend 20 to 30 hours a week doing that job. I don't see how a county commissioner could possibly work that into their schedule. And then there's also potential conflicts for members if we use elected officials uh, that don't presently exist at the tab. And we can talk about that in more detail at a subsequent time. So uh, my, my uh, uh, position is that uh, I don't think we should have an elected Met Council uh, join uh, Mayor Coutts. I like the staggered terms idea. My experience is that it's such a whole new world of acronyms and knowledge that you have to acquire that having a staggered term situation would be very helpful. Uh, this nominating committee, I like a great deal. I think it really serves as an effective filter for the governor. I would like to see it uh, beefed up a little bit. Uh, I'd like to see a situation where the slate that the nominating committee uh, proposes, uh, those we select, the, the governor selects from that slate uh, unless there's good cause shown as to why he should not do that and then figure out some kind of a definition of good cause shown. So the work that that nominating committee does is vitally important to this whole process. Uh, with respect to the effectiveness of transit service that it pre as it presently exists with the combination of uh, both Metro Transit and our um, opt-outs, I found it to work very effectively over the years and I, uh, I would be supportive of maintaining that same model for transit service delivery. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, and uh, I know that you two have to drop off and we might as well s stay with the trifecta of mayors and let uh, Mayor Williams go next in case she's also joining you. I'm not sure if she is or not, but let's let's go through the mayor <laughs> first. So Mayor Williams. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, no, I'm not going off to that meeting. Um, for the first thing, uh, the Metropolitan Council and the MPO, I feel that um, that the Metropolitan Council, as it, as it operates with the TAD, traditionally has done a good job. And I know that um, there's been a lot of interest through the years of changing that. There have been about six studies, which I've read all of them, and the majority of them don't recommend that. Um, I believe that um, the nominating committee, and we haven't talked a lot about that, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about it because I've been on it a couple of times and I chaired it the last time. And what never comes out is the fact that the nominating committee is made up of, of elected officials. During the previous, like in Governor Dayton's um, tenure, 
the nominating committee had five elected officials and then one business person and then another person at large. With Governor Walz, this was expanded so that there uh, were seven elected officials as was laid out in the paper that was distributed to us. Um, what's interesting about that is there are elected officials who represent each one of the counties that may be a mayor or it might be a county commissioner. So you have elected officials because according to the guidelines, the majority of them on that committee need to be elected officials. So you have elected officials who are going through, as was spelled out in the document in our last time, we went through 200 applications. And of that, we um, interviewed um, 79. And so all of those interviews are open. The names are all published. Um, in fact, you can even go back and watch the interviews. We then make uh, decisions on who should be recommended to the council. It's all nonpartisan. They don't ask who, you know, what party the elected officials are in. And as city and counties, we don't let that out anyway. But uh, we don't designate that. But under the, uh, and the same with the people who are applying. I don't know how many people have seen the application, but that kind of information isn't there. And it's always impressed me as to how um, involved and educated these people are. And I think if you look at the last, a photo of the last nominating committee, it's recommendations and those who were appointed to the Metropolitan Council, um, you see there the diversity and the gender balance that represents the, met the, the metropolitan region. And the other thing is, is that when a person, an elected official chooses to be, to apply for the Metropolitan Council, and if they are selected, they have to agree to give up their elected position. So there are no elected members on the Metropolitan Council board according to those guidelines. Um, so I think that I don't agree with an elected account, elected council. I think that there is transparency there. And um, I think that the Metropolitan Council, as we move on to the MPO and the other things that they, they people say, well, you know, we're only one out of 400. Well, that doesn't mean that we are not doing a good job here. And from other states that I've been involved with, they um, have commented on the job that we do do here. Um, the other thing is with regard to suburban transit. The suburban transit group, because I'm a member of MBTA and was one of, right when it started, is that um, that was started because those in the suburbs felt that they were not getting proper appropriate service for the money that they were paying. And so now what I believe is happening is by taking the, the license plate numbers of those who are parked in our parking ramps are finding out that at over 40% of those who are using the suburban transit are from outside of the taxing district. And so it seems that if that is supposed to, will continue, that that needs to be explored in further discussions. So that's my comments. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. So I was trying to think of how we next order and I wrote, if we go from like oldest to youngest, that would make people disclose things they probably don't want to disclose. So I'm going to, we're going to do birthdays. So is there anybody that has a birthday in January? Raise your hand. Anybody with a birthday in January? Nope. Okay. Anybody with a birthday in February? Oh, this is interesting. Okay, anybody with a birthday in March? Okay, Jerry, you're up. We got up to three minutes. Open County too. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
uh, uh, I yeah have two thoughts. One about the issue of whether to have elected officers in the council, and the second is about uh, the staggered term. Regarding the first issue, I think uh, from feasibility perspective, right now it seems uh, the system is working okay. Uh, the legality issue is not there since uh, of the grandfather rule, and we really need to pay the attention that if we want to change, uh, we want to make sure that the, the 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 new way is designed in a way that would meet the federal uh, regulation. Otherwise, I think the transition process will be really uh, cumbersome. And more important is uh, the desirability of whether we want to make a change. I can certainly understand uh, some argument for that kind of change uh, so that uh, where elected officials may have more accountability. But on the other hand, uh, I some may also uh, express the concern that the accountability to their local governments may not be exactly the same of accountability to the regional benefits. So in short, I think regarding the first issue of whether to have elected officers, I am more leaning to uh, keeping the current way if it's working fine unless we have a good proposal that's in hand that we can compare to the status quo. And for the second issue of having staggered uh, council members, I think that would be a good idea. Just think about uh, this many presentations we need to hear just to be able to get familiar with how uh, the council work. I think uh, that kind of historical memory or experiences of someone serving in a term, not the whole, I think it, it's a good thing. And certainly, uh, if we would move toward that way, there are some transitional issues, but I think that could be managed. Uh, I, I understand it would be harder to cut someone's term short, but we could always manage in a way that for the newly elected terms, we can set aside some seeds where in the transition period, we have a time scaling term and then before we totally move into that uh, situation. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite supportive of the second idea about the possibility of having staggered terms. And for the third issue, uh, suburban issues, I don't have a strong up preference at this moment, so I would uh, still like to hear more. Okay, okay, great. Thank you very much. Connie, I think you're next. If the it is, you have a March birthday. March, <clears throat> yes, March 11th. There you go. To be exact. Um, with regard to the uh, governance, I. Well, I agree, and I worked in the tab atmosphere that was discussed earlier. I know it works well. There was hardly ever uh, issues between the tab and the, and the council. And uh, but I continuously go go back to I mentioned this this before that it's that the subject continues to come up every year. Um, about this, whether it's legal or not. We've heard presentation last time, there are some folks that strongly believe it's illegal. And I'm not a lawyer to know that. So it's kind of a gray area, uh, gray, gray law. So it, in my mind, unless we're okay with, with this to come up every, every year, the subject, I don't think it's gonna go away from the way I, the way I see it, that, uh, that something should happen, and, and ideally it would be a collab something that's collaborative that everybody uh, would agree to. But I know that's difficult. Uh, do we actually do we believe that? Again, I think the system that we have works, but do we actually believe that it's and, and are convinced that it is better than than uh, all um, all the other states and all the other. Uh, and uh, MPOs, that's the case. We can convince us of ourselves of it and convince those who are against it within our own state, then, uh, then fine, uh, we, should, we should keep it. So the issue won't go away every year. You talk about funding and transportation issues. It, it, I've used the word thrown on our side. It's gonna keep coming up and some, something should, should happen. And there is many, many proposals, many thoughts and ideas that, that can be discussed. I have my personal views and, uh, and I understand the reasons that folks don't wanna, don't wanna change and it's working fine. Uh, quickly on the, um, uh, on the transit, on the transit portion, it, it's, it is clear uh, to me and from what I've heard that there is some Trust issues. There is some uh, uh, 
uh, inefficiencies that can be can be taken care of and uh, and I believe that also needs to be looked at and there needs to be a, a change if not I don't I don't think that issue is going to go away either that continues to be a issue for the region so that's kind of where I'm at now. All right, thank you. Any other March birthdays? All right, happy April. Any April birthdays? Okay, May. Anybody in May? June. <laughs> All right, Mr. Bell. Well, um, my thoughts are somewhat in sync with uh, previous speakers. Uh, I'm not a strong, I'm an opponent of an elected council. I, I, I don't think that that would, I think to get from where we're at now there would be too difficult and I'm not sure of the benefits. Perhaps where I differ most from the previous speakers is I have serious reservations about the continued usefulness of the suburban transit providers. I think their concerns were from a bygone era. I don't think that they still would still exist if they weren't uh, in existence, those same concerns. And I think that they could be addressed by how we appoint uh, our council members. Uh, they don't represent the entire suburban community. There's duplication in administrative costs. And I think some cost savings could be realized uh, if they didn't exist. The third concern or point I have is about the nominating committee. Mayor Williams talked about that. Uh, I would uh, move even further in the direction of having local input. I probably would have something like the seven county commissioner boards uh, uh, that if you wanted to be on the council, you had to apply to the county boards the county boards would then pass those recommendations on to the nominating committee, which would be appointed by the governor. And then the governor would ultimately appoint who the council members are. I, I, I probably would give a list of two or three seats um, per district and the governor would have to choose from them or alternatively, the suggestion that was made earlier that the governor would have to give good cause on why uh, he or she did not pick from that list. But I would um, uh, in some have the county boards more involved and the, the, the nominees pass through the county boards to the nominating committee. And the final point is I think the tab works well as it does. I would disagree with I, what I think Mayor Kautz was going, that the, the tab um, would, would be essentially the MPO or the primary decision maker. I think how it works now is a good collegial way, and I don't think it's pro. So those would be my recommendations right. or my concerns or issues. Great. Thank you, Chair Bell. Any other June birthdays? Oh, Mr. Weaver. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, since I used to work for Peter, I should just say that I agree with everything. You said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never did when we were at the council. So. <laughs> uh, with respect to the governance structure, I, I, I don't think there's anything broken, but um, I do think there are, are some things that are worth looking at. I, I agree with the arguments against an elected Med Council. I think it would become much more parochial and have uh, a, a reduced kind of regional perspective. So I think that would be a problem. But I also want to be mindful of local government's uh, view on this and whether they think they're adequately represented. And I think having them participate in the nominating process is certainly helpful. Um, and and you know, we've heard from the mayors on this committee that, that they don't support an elected Met Council either, but maybe they are, there are some things we can do around the edges to, to give local units of government a little more influence over the appointment process. And, and Peter alluded to some of that. And going back to what Connie said, I think that's one of the reasons that this issue comes up at the legislature every year and becomes a big distraction every year for the council and the legislature. And maybe if there's something we can do to just improve uh, the local unit of government's influence on who gets appointed to the council, maybe that would 
um, reduce that frequency anyway. Um, with respect to the delivery of transit, um, I think it's pretty clear based on what we've seen uh, in the letters that have gone back and forth that uh, the current structure is legally sufficient from a federal perspective. I think the tab works. I think it, it works pretty well. Um, and with respect to opt-outs, I mean, I, I used to believe that um, they just weren't, were no longer necessary. Uh, I think if we were designing a, a entirely new system today, we probably wouldn't create it with opt-outs. Uh, but I also think that they're pretty well entrenched at this point. I think there is some legitimacy to the argument that they're kind of pilot workshops and that uh, they're free to be a little more innovative and we can all learn some things from the way they're doing things. So I'm pretty open-minded with respect to that one. That's all I've got, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other June birthdays? Okay, July. Oh, Pat. Oh, and Commissioner McGuire. Pat, go ahead. Um, to the to the issue of appointed and elected, I would continue the appointments by the governor uh, to but to staggered terms. I do think staggered terms will have. Uh, a good outcome, at least a good outcome, meaning uh, less swings of policy between um, newly appointed councils uh, when there are new governors. Um, so, and I think that leads to and contributes to uh, additional trust in the Metropolitan Council by local uh, officials. Uh, it's not going to solve everybody's problem and everybody's complaints about the councils today, but I think it will diminish the large swings in policy that can happen when there's a change in governor. Uh, I don't think we've heard anything compelling about a change in the MPO status and how that's done. And frankly, it would be a, a very difficult thing to get everybody to hold hands uh, to get an approval uh, of a redesignation, even if we did think that there was a compelling reason to do so. I think the MPO process works well. Um, to the suburban transit providers, I, I think there's an argument that uh, they're not as efficient simply because they're smaller. It's not because they're not good managers. They are good managers, and they are creative, and they are very responsive to their local governments. And were we to, uh, because of efficiency reasons, uh, do away with the suburban transit providers, uh, I, I think there needs to be something in place to, to address the service um, attention that those suburbs provide uh, by having local control of their uh, of their uh, transit providers. I, I also think that it would be, um, as somebody might say, the ju the juice, meaning the <laughs> the efficiency, might not be worth the squeeze, which is the political uh, blowback from. Uh, and everybody on this call knows who that uh, expression comes from. Uh, I, I just am not sure that that's worth uh, pursuing at this point, unless the economics are uh, really compelling. And I, I, I don't think we've heard enough to hear that that might be the case. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Mary Jo, uh, Commissioner McGuire. Hey. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's uh, great to hear all the comments of my colleagues on this uh, on this committee here, and I'll just uh, continue to weigh in. And I uh, agree with, uh, um, I think, almost everyone that I don't believe that we should uh, go to an elected elected council. I'm happy to look at staggered terms. And um, I feel that what we have now is not necessarily broken. I, I understand that there's people that feel that they may not be as represented on there. And so I think we could address that in other ways other than electing, uh, directly electing people to the council. So I'm curious about some of the other ideas that people are suggesting about local units having some, of uh, government having some participation in that selection process. So I'm happy to look at that. But I um, I think having the governor appoint the, the council is still a, a system that isn't broken as far as I'm, as I'm concerned. I serve on TAB, uh, as many of you know, and I do I've come to to really respect that or 
that uh, board as just being such a great representative of the of the area of the region of both elected and non-elected of, of every mode of transportation um, level of government I think it's just a great representative body and so I I think it works well now as a a, a body that does give give uh, Council, I'll say, or you know, that does make those decisions that then uh, the Met Council, uh, whether they whether we call it ratifying or approving of them, I think that's a, a process that works for us now. As far as the Metropolitan Council being a, an MPO, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I agree that they should continue to be the the MPO. Um, there's just some things that maybe are part of what the MPO does, such as transit operations that we could look at. Maybe we take those out that sometimes that doesn't seem to be as strong a connect that the planning organization also do operations. So I'm just thinking that that's an area we might want to look at. And then the, the issues, there are some issues for delivering uh, transit projects that uh, the local partners fund the projects and then the Met Council actually um, uh, they uh, make sure that it happens. So they don't have any money in it, but they are the ones that carry out the project. So I think that there is things we should look at there about how those how those transit projects uh, are delivered. So I'm those are just some areas that I I think we could look at um, as we're uh, you know really analyzing transportation operations um, in the region. And as far as opt-outs, I, I agree with things that have been said. I, I If we were redesigning the system, I think that we wouldn't have them in there. I'm happy to look at other ways that we could incorporate them into the whole system so they wouldn't have to be opt-outs. So um, that would be my inclination, but I'm, I'm ready to continue to learn. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner McGuire. Any other July birthdays? On to August. Anybody August? September. Anybody in September? Aileen, you're up. Um, well, thank you. I think I, I also kind of agree with a number of the comments that have been made previously and was really hoping that if we have one outcome from this, I mean, I'm sure there will be other outcomes, but one I think important outcome is really the argument that we've heard for many years that the MPO, that the Metropolitan Council is not in compliance with federal law. I think it's been, we've like understood it now really clearly that the USDOT, the executive branch agency that's responsible for interpreting the will of Congress has had about 30 years to do that and has really come back now repeatedly and said that the Met Council is in fact in compliance with federal law. So I think that that's really helpful for this whole group to hear, to have it be on record and to have our audience members also listening, hear that and understand that if you wanna make an argument, an argument about council governance, let's make the argument about council governance and not tie it to kind of an incorrect ar argument about the status of our MPO. So that's one thing that I think has been really helpful. The other thing that I think about, and I, I kind of agree with others on the, on the committee about really the question between elected versus appointed. And I think I see a whole host of issues with elected officials serving directly on the council. And I think the, the appointed group works pretty well. I think Mayor Hoplin made the point about it's a major time commitment, but it's also about really thinking about the full scope of the responsibilities of the council. I think many of the recommendations that have come forward that are that include in, include elected officials on the council have been based on an understanding of the transportation planning components of the council. And I think Nick Thompson really stated clearly in our first meeting that really the MPO function of the Met Council is really like 25 people of like the roughly 4,500 that work for the agency in, in services like wastewater, housing, parks, and a whole bunch of other areas. So, um, so I would be in favor of continuing something on the appointed side. I think there is an argument, I believe, just in terms of continuity for um, maybe staggered terms. I think that that's something that should be looked at. We've talked a bit about the appointment process and there have been some suggestions about how we might change the appointment process. I would just recommend that any kind of gatekeeper or any other organization or group that we put together to think about who we would appoint onto the council should really be um, looked at from a perspective of making sure that we have diverse opinions and really are fully representing the community that the Metropolitan Council ultimately serves. So I think that that would be like a key principle that we would wanna make sure gets um, kind of codified in whatever we put forward. 
I think in terms of the effectiveness of the regional transit providers, I share some of the concerns that Peter Bell mentioned as well, just in terms of looking at the efficiency of the system overall um, and would, I think, you know, I know we'd asked kind of information early on about what does that look like? How, how are um, suburban, suburban transit providers providing service in a way that is really cost effective, especially as we look at the significant um, budget deficits that we're, that, that we're facing as an entire state, as a nation, just in, especially in COVID, but really thinking about are there opportunities to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of our overall transit service? Thank you. Thank you. So I think we were in August. Anybody else? Or you were September? It was September. Sorry. Oh, September. Okay, any other September? Okay, how about October? No Octobers? Madam Chair, you're going too fast. So I'm, a, I'm in August, so I can, I can jump in here. All right, that would be great. Okay, so I'll just to be brief, um, I agree with most of the comments already. I would not go to an elected body. I would, I, I do believe the Met Council is the appropriate um, body for the MPO. And it seems like if we were to go a different direction as a, a, and come up with a different MPO, it'd be a solution in search of a problem. And the one thing said about the, the regional, that has not been said about the regional transit is, while they may bring in some uh, innovation, I, I would not favor seeing that expanded so that the, uh, I would not be in favor of seeing somehow the transit system become balkanized and have more opt-outs, um, which would really affect the efficiency of the entire uh, system. Yeah. But I, I, I think it's, from what I've seen, the metrics look good and they, they actually perform a, a decent service at a decent price. So th those would be my thoughts. No elected, continue as the MPO, but not expand the opt-out system if, if that's even on the table. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you, George. I'm sorry I moved too fast. <laughs> okay. okay, so September, October. Any October? Okay, November. Doug and Jay. Well, uh, most importantly, it's my birthday week. So. And um, what day is your birthday? Well, that's not disclosed, <laughs> Madam Chair. I'll just I point out this. The, the day <laughs> of the not month, today. not the year. <laughs> uh, it's on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Um, right. <laughs> so uh, let me just start off with um, on the governance side um, the chamber has long aligned itself with uh, the office of legislative auditors report I think from 2011 that suggested that the uh, legislature should restructure Met council along the lines of a mix appointment and elected council members I would say having um, elected officials serve on the Met council seems to be a great way to build legitimacy where some people would question that legitimacy of the Met Council. Um, that being said, I don't think the Met Council is broken. I think the Met Council is a brilliant idea that has been executed well over time, bringing together a diverse metropolitan area like ours with a lot of communities, uh, with a lot of varying interests. Uh, that's very difficult. I think the Met Council has done a good job of bringing balance and direction and forward thinking in that space. But I do question whether or not the long-term legitimacy of the Met Council is questioned um, without some governance reforms to bring um, some alignment, if you will. Being an anomaly nationally, I don't think is something that's healthy and it's always gonna raise questions about uh, the work of the Met Council. Uh, I think you could go a long way towards building that sense of legitimacy by making some reforms around appointments and having staggered terms. I think that would go a long way towards reassuring it. Um, I know that we've talked about the legal uh, position that the DOT has validated on um, the, the standing um, of and meeting the, meeting the expectations of the grandfathering. Um, but I still think that raises questions. And I would, I would say that's a, that's a legal thread that is always gonna be questioned. So I think Connie, you said it earlier, um, if this isn't addressed now, it's gonna to continue to linger. Uh, and maybe uh, staggered terms and uh, we're looking hard at the nominating process could help that, but I suspect we'll be back here or some panel like us will be back again 
Um, so I go, I would encourage you guys to go back and look at the legislative auditor's report. Um, I think there's some good things in it that could be looked at. I would also just suggest that if there are conflicts of interest uh, that could arise by having elected officials uh, on the Met Council or part of the Met Council, if it works for the tab, why wouldn't it work for the full council? Um, so, how, so I just, I need to understand that um, better. If it's working there at the tab, why wouldn't it work at the full council level? Um, as far as the MPO, I think that that is legit and from a standpoint of the Met Council should be the MPO. Um, and I would also say that the suburban transit system, uh, we don't really have a stake in that as an organization. I would say my personal experience is it works well. Um, we did check in with the local chamber community who feels very strongly about the um, suburban transit system. Uh, and they believe it works very well. Somebody said earlier, they're very responsive to their local elected officials. I would also say they're very responsive to the local business community. Uh, and they are uh, incubators of innovation. And I think that's a great thing. So I'd like to see uh, on behalf of the local chambers that, um, that I guess, um, organizational structure uh, continue into the future. Thank you. All right, thanks, Doug. Jay, you're next. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my apologies, Doug, for stepping away. Uh, keys locked in the car. Uh, uh, briefly, uh, as far as I can tell, the, the legal case that uh, the Met Council is not in compliance with federal law uh, appears to have been well answered, I think, by counsel. Uh, so, and I think also, as many have said, that the process of moving to a different form of MPO uh, would require a, a reweaving uh, that would be both very complicated and politically very difficult to achieve. Uh, as, best, as best I can tell from my vantage point, uh, Met Council has done a good job and made a number of accommodations over the years in order to address the concerns or the interests of, of local officials. I think the improvements in the nominating committee are positive, but I think that's an area of uh, continued opportunity, perhaps. I think it'd be worthy of some uh, specific discussion uh, at some point about uh, options there. I would be strongly, in, uh, I like appointed uh, by the governor, I think, Part of the purpose of the organization is to be able to look across topics, be it transportation, wastewater, sewer, parks and recreation, housing to some extent, uh, and, and provide a kind of uh, a, a, a perspective that uh, uh, essentially represents a regional perspective for which none of the officials have been elected. On the other hand, uh, I like very much and would be very much in favor of staggered terms uh, because I think continuity is really critical with large complicated organizations. And I think by reducing the degree to which in whole cloth, the Met Council is reappointed with every new governor term uh, or a new governor, uh, you're, you're avoiding the the most obvious dimensions of, of a sort of political uh, uh, detachment from local interests uh, by putting uh, uh, the full slate in the hands of a single governor. Uh, and I would say on the issue of opt-outs, that is a topic that I don't feel that we've necessarily clarified or presented adequate information for me to have an opinion uh, about. Uh, but I am listening carefully and I appreciate all the experience uh, represented here in the group. Thank you. All right, thank you. So who are you, December? I am. I'm gonna let you go. I'm November, but I'll go last. So you go ahead. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll speak to the elected officials first, and then I'll, I'll work my way to the other items. Uh, during our time at the Citizens League, when I was there, and we studied whether elected officials or not, um, I think what I took away from that, that experience and that exercise was that cities uh, were not supportive of elected officials. So 
when you think about the Met Council doing its work in partnership with 189 communities in seven counties, and the cities are not stepping up to say we are supportive of this, this really helped inform my own um, thoughts and views on elected officials. And in the minority report of the Citizens League um, report, you will see that there were some uh, recommendations on how counties might put forward uh, representation, but there wasn't a mechanism in place or one that was ever agreed to about how cities would um, choose among themselves uh, to serve on an elected Met Council. And so I just put that out there for everybody. Um, I agree with everyone else who said already that we haven't heard anything uh, thus far that puts into question the MPO being out of compliance. Staggered terms, uh, uh, I support staggered terms. Uh, the Citizens League report uh, put forward staggered terms. I don't know how uh, many years Deb Barber and Wendy Wolf will continue to serve on the Met Council, but one thing I did learn from both of them uh, being carryover uh, Met Council members is there's so much work building the capacity of Met Council members, knowledge of their roles, what they do. Um, and this is besides the point of, of you know, whether they are um, embedded in community, I think that it's just a really um, tough and big job. And so a staggered term uh, would allow there to be some continuity and of course carry over from the previous administration. I agree with, um, with Jay talking about nominations. I think there's room there for improvement. I think this last round of nominations where I got to serve with, with Janet, um, I think we, tried really hard to make sure there was representation and an openness and transparency. Um, I don't know that this has been said before, but one key piece um, that Governor Walls put into place and that was in the Citizens League recommendation was the public display or notification of final candidates. Um, I'm sure most of you already know, and it's, perhaps it's been said before, but the governor cannot be compelled to select from just those recommendations. Um, state constitution allows him or her to choose um, candidates um, as they wish. And so in order to um, provide further transparency by asking for those final candidates to be made public before he or, uh, or, he or she makes those final recommendations, I think is really important and would go a long way into building that trust uh, in community. I think I've covered all my points, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. So um, I have a, a number of, uh, of things that I agree on, but I'm going to start with raising some issues that really nobody's brought up that I think um, at least I'd like to throw on the table. Um, you know, representing a community that uh, for decades has felt not a part or represented, um, you know, when people talk about the tab working great, um, you know. I don't, I don't know that that's shared across the entire region. All, you know, I mean, I don't think you, if everybody was happy, you would have seen lawsuits. Okay, so let's, you know, just put that on the table. So, but I, I also back to the juice and the squeeze issue to try and change it. It seems uh, quite large. But when you look at the appointment process, it is true that half of approximately half are elected, but the rest are appointed. And of course, the governor appoints the entire Met Council. So, I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about is short of a wholesale um, changing of the MPO is maybe you raise the threshold so that the recommendations have to be a super majority. So that in other words, uh, given that it's about half appointed, half um, elected officials having a higher standard for a recommendation might make sure that it, at least a fair share of the composition of the group um, desires would be uh, reflected. And then I'm not for a 100% elected my council. I think staggered terms are okay. I think with the redistricting, you'd have to do some kind of, you know, 10 year re-upping at, um, at the time of redistricting. So you'd have to have half the council with two years, four years, four years, and the other half with four years, four years, two years. So I think every 10 years, 
you'd have to have a complete turnover to allow for redistricting of the, the things. But I think, you know, the MPO issue to me is, is in the big scheme of all the money, it's a very small share of the total transportation money going into the metro across the state. So I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time and effort around that particular element. But I do think there needs to be a discussion about some of the inherent conflicts. And you have the opt-outs, uh, you know, begging for money from somebody from Met Council that's also the operator of Metro Transit and Metro Mobility. And it doesn't really seem like a fair playing field. And I don't, I'm not sure you should be both an operator and a funder. And so does it, does it make sense on the, the issue of the, the state funding that maybe it be uh, distributed by uh, MnDOT for the purposes of the transit, um, you know, the MVEST, et cetera, so that everybody, Metro Transit, the opt-outs could every, all go to the same uh, altar, if you will, uh, for funding and compete based on need rather than having this uh, unequal um, dynamic between Metro, uh, Met Council being, you know, Metro uh, Transit and then um, having the ability to uh, control uh, opt-outs futures. There's a lot of conflict out here about the Met Council taking over the red line uh, operations away from MVTA. Um, these little uh, mini dramas continue to uh, percolate over the years. And then in order for that to even make any kind of sense, this whole issue of paratransit and why, the, I mean, I think that the whole Metro Transit should be funded as a forecasted program, whether it's through transportation or health and human services, but again, be on the same playing field because what we're seeing is that Metro Mobility with its rapid cost is cannibalizing funding for the regular route, uh, bus and rail programs. And so my, my issues are more around balance and philosophy. And um, I mean, I, I wish that you could segment out metro mobility um and so that not i mean it, it doesn't make sense why is the met council at the legislature begging for funding for their total program when in greater minnesota a big share of that money comes through health and human services and as for i mean it, there's just some really inherent weirdness to who has the money, who gets to spend it, who decides how it's spent. And all of those things, I think, contribute to the lack of satisfaction or uh, thought about fairness prevailing and that there's so many masters um, on different levels. And I, you know, it's really easy. Um, I mean, I think that uh, Chair Bell is still on, on board, but I mean, the consternation of the core cities in the Plenty administration. Um, I think about uh, Annette Meeks being appointed, uh, you know, the Green Line fight, the North Star fight. Um, you know, there wasn't um, a lot of continuity. So I think it kind of matters who's in charge and whose administration. And that's really bad for continuity of a region because transportation projects take decades to accomplish, and there really isn't a shared vision. So I, I probably used more than my three minutes and we're over our time, I apologize, but um, I don't know where we go from here if we just adjourn, but I know I've put some new issues on the table and I don't know if anybody wants to explore any of them um, as well, but. So, Chair Bell, you were there in the Palenti administration days. Do you really think things are so hunky-dory? You're muted. 
you know, it's compared to what? Uh, uh, I don't think that they're so hunky-dory, but I think that the Met Council writ large is as functional as, um, largely speaking, as it can be. Uh, and I think from my perspective, uh, I am down to uh, find finer sandpaper in the recommendations that I would recommend rather than wholesale changes. Uh, when I was chair, we did have uh, a diverse set of opinions and the like, but I thought that we were largely able to move forward as a body. And I think that that's been true with successive councils as well. So um, uh, I don't, though I think you raised some good points. Um, uh, and I'm really concerned about the juice versus the squeeze question with suburban transit providers and others. Um, but uh, I think the changes that we're talking about are more fine sandpaper, and that would be the metaphor I'd use. All right, any other comments before we adjourn? Mayor Williams. Well, I just, thank you. I just think that part of the, the struggle between with, with some of the animosity has to do with the struggle between the counties and the cities that underlies this. Yeah, I well, I mean, I think, I, I mean, from my perspective, I don't think you ever would had, ever would have had a CTIB if Met Council was effective. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, no, I, I, I think actually, to be blunt, that that was part of the dynamics of because uh, CTIP came about when I was chair of the Met Council. I think that that came about, frankly, because of uh, many of the counties feeling transit was being starved in the Plenty administration, and they wanted to figure out a way of getting more resources in. And they didn't want to put more resources in if they weren't going to be in control of those resources. And so that kind of led to the development of CTIP. Uh, but I don't know if there was any structural or fundamental concerns about council governance per se. It was where's the money coming from and then who's going to control that money is how I viewed it at the time. Judd may have a different opinion. But, and but, I would, go but, ahead. It, but what it says is that there wasn't a regional perspective, that the seven county metro region it, to some degree is a farce. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, but I, I think that I don't know that you can ever, you, you know, you made the point about, well, we're not all in agreement or there wouldn't be lawsuits. To me, again, it's compared to what? Uh, I think no matter what mechanism, what governance structure we have, there's going to be people who are outside of it and uncomfortable with it. I think we have a responsibility to minimize that. I don't think we should ever have the ex expectation that we're going to eliminate that. The conflict I, I, I'm speaking about, Madam mm -hmm. Chair. All right, anything else? We're beyond time. Judd. Okay, well, it looks like we're winding down here and I have all kinds of thoughts about all of these, at least last <laughs> few minutes worth of conversation. And, uh, but I'm gonna park those because uh, my opinion doesn't matter on those. But what I'm going to um, mention is um, I'm trying to draw a little bit from what the committee uh, has been talking about here today so we can start working and uh, toward at least some recommendations for this group to make before we have our last meeting uh, here um, two meetings from now. And so I just want to um, make sure that we, um, that I'm maybe going in the right direction. So I, it sounds like the, the uh, group is not in favor of uh, pursuing anything related to a um, to a, an elected Met Council. It seems like, um, the, while it may not be perfect, uh, we may be looking at making recommendations related to um, staggered terms and, uh, and 
and pursuing a little bit more related to the nominating committee uh, on that first tier of um, elected versus unelected met council that this may be uh, the sweet spot at least that this group um, may not be in 100 percent agreement but um, it seems like that's where everybody's going um, so i can start working on something related to that on the uh, second piece related to the um, MPO, it also seems like, uh, you know, folks are relatively comfortable uh, with the MPO the way it is. I know that uh, Doug has made a couple points related to, you know, this isn't perfect, um, which, you know, and, and this debate will continue. I think that that's true, but uh, potentially um, moving to that staggered term and um, and nominating committee piece will potentially have something more to do about that. I don't know if this committee is interested in pursuing uh, the weighted voting option that was brought forward, but we can um, certainly um, draft something up related to that if people are interested. And then on the um, on the last piece that talks about um, regional transit service, I do not see uh, there being um, um, uh, people coalescing around uh, making an adjustment to the suburban transit providers. Uh, we have talked a little bit about Metro Mobility. And so I don't, um, if, if I were to potentially start working on a potential recommendation, um, I think everybody I, this is why I'm checking, but are people comfortable with us uh, working toward something that we can put in front of you related to Metro Mobility and uh, its importance as a um, federal and state mandated program and potentially pursuing something um, along the lines of forecasting that. Um, and if I'm missing something, please let me know. I'm really not trying to lead or direct this group. Uh, what I'm trying to do is uh, understand where people are coming from so at least we can put something in front of you uh, when we make our recommendations here in a in a couple uh, in a couple meetings so I'm gonna stop here and I think it's so hilarious to hear us talking about the juice and the squeeze and uh, Peter uh, it just cracked me up <laughs> <laughs> Judd, one thing I would like to hear with Metro mobility is how far beyond the federally mandated guidelines our Metro Mobility services, and do we have a cost for that? And so, in other words, if we were, if Metro Mobility were just in the federally mandated guidelines, which my understanding have to mimic Metro Transit services, what would the what's the cost delta for that additional service that's provided? You know, uh, Peter, that is a good point. I will tell you that, you know, the legislature has adopted boundaries beyond the um, uh, the federal guideline. And so we can sh we can certainly show you that. However, we are now bound by state statute to provide that service area. One of the things that um, that we're also potentially able to do is um, in those areas that aren't uh, federally mandated, uh, we can. Uh, we have a little bit more flexibility in the um, time and uh, amount of service that we have to pro provide in those areas uh, when you compare it to the federal mandate. But um, I'll work with Nick and our folks that handle Metro Mobility, and we'll be able to provide uh, some of that. Thank and you. I'll and I'll actually try to get that out to the members here um, you know, well in advance of our next meeting so people can chew on that a little bit, and then we can actually have a conversation about it. And Jed, I know you're still working on financials for the opt-outs. Some, some, you know, wanted to see more information before making some final recommendations. So whatever you're able to gather before our next meeting would be helpful. And also, I think it would be helpful to find out what the cost of the ADA services are in the opt-out service areas. We, you know, we. We heard some testimony from the opt-outs regarding the amount of funding that they received, you know, but they didn't they didn't reflect what the cost of providing that other service in their areas that's being born out of the Met uh, mobility budget. And I, I think that's a good point, and I appreciate you making that. I guess the if I understand you right, and we haven't talked about this, is uh, Metro Mobility is is required in areas where there is regular out service. And so what you're asking for is in those areas that are pro 
uh, provided by the suburban transit providers, that that regular route service that they have initiates the, the mandated federal and state um, Metro Mobility Service. So are you asking me to look at that and be able to show you um, what the cost is based on their regular out service in their areas that they provide that service? Yes. So I know that's a mouthful, I'm sorry. Well, we had the testimony by Luther that talked about the percentage of money where it came and where it went, but a big okay. piece of that didn't reflect any of the Metro Mobility costs into those opt-out areas. And so if we are going to try and at least on some level compare apples to apples, that wouldn't be an important component of yep, the I opt-out see. area cost of a service. And I see that as kind of the but for test. And so we will be able to provide uh, that information and I'll talk to Nick and our staff to see if we can um, if we can shake that out and I'll try to get that around to everybody. Okay, real quickly, we're way over time. I just sincerely apologize for that. Any other quick questions? Connie? Yeah, yes, Madam Chair, thanks. Uh, quickly, is our expectation or deliverable, is it the, the, uh, a proposal or multiple themes for, I suppose, for the governor to consider or eventually a legislature to act on? Or is it like one one thing that, for example, what Judd heard, or is it like maybe multiple, you know, two or three themes that people can pick and choose from? Well, I think at this point we can do whatever we want as a group. You know, I mean, I don't think that the governor's charge was so prescriptive that it would preclude both. Yeah. So. And Commissioner McGuire. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. On, on that line, uh, Judd, when you were kind of summarizing things, I, I didn't quite hear that we were not interested in the opt-outs. I think we would like more information. So I'm just highlighting that case as you, Madam Chair, mentioned that we just I'd like to see more information on the opt-outs. I don't know that I didn't I didn't hear a consensus on what we were gonna do about them, but maybe other people maybe I'm wrong. But I mean there were people that voiced opinions on it, but I I think it's definitely a conversation to be had. Thanks. And I will be happy to uh, to pull that together. And just to speak to Connie's question is, um, I don't think there's an expectation that there is, that there has to be a recommendation that is brought forward. Um, I think that this group can look at all of things within all of these issue areas and say, you might wanna look at doing this or this deserves uh, further um, review by the legislature or the governor. Uh, but I don't think that there's any expectation that this group have uh, a recommendation that is then turned into a bill that necessarily the governor is gonna turn around and drop on the, um, uh, or introduce at the legislature here next year. I mean, this is to, again, have this group of regional leaders take a look at um, these issues that we have regionally and uh, just see where, where all of this shakes out. And those three issues, and particularly the elected versus unelected, the MPO and the delivery of regional transit surface services are the issues that continue to bubble up to the top. And so that's where we're just ha going to have another conversation about it. But I, as, as the chair said, you know, we this group can do whatever it wants, but there isn't a set deliverable that you have to create and and send as part of a uh, a report to him. Madam Chair. Yes, Chair Bell. Uh, yes, uh, Judd, one other very quick point. A number of people said that uh, suburban transit providers provided uh, um, a fair amount of innovation. I, I would appreciate it when you bring us uh, information back, some examples of that innovation. Sure. Anything else? All right. Well, happy birthday to, uh, <laughs> to Doug. And Doug, uh, yes. with that, uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.